So while I'm in the midst of going over some material for myself, for my own usage, while working on entries for both the Volume 8 and Volume 9, whose editings, I figured this might be a good time to do something like a Secret Files and Origins for the DC Encyclopedia. The following podcast contains mature language and spoilers. Listener discretion is advised. Most of what came out in Volume 1 from me was the snowballs, the spaghetti on the walls, that kind of thing, because I had no reason to expect that this was going to be a continuing thing. And then not only does Siskoid come out with Volume 2 of Who's Editing, but it comes out really fucking fast, like a month later, which I was not expecting. It seemed like the kind of project that would come out like bi-monthly or quarterly. So him knocking it out that quickly jump-started me. Another thing that was important, though, was particularly Azrael's entry, because this was another character that I had a passing familiarity with. He was popping up in a lot of Titans material at the time when I was still buying it off the newsstand. And then when I went back and bought more Titans material, I at least kind of scanned through a lot of the stuff that he appeared in. And also in researching for the Volume 2 entries, I came across a lot of stuff on like the Titans Tower website and such talking about how Marvel found all these cool ideas and plans for Azrael that never came to fruition. In fact, he had kept them so secret he himself had forgotten what the hell he was going to do. To me, it felt like if I'm going to do something with Azrael... I want to do something that would pay off all those seeds that Marvel Wolfman had planted in particular. He made a point of mentioning this guy in the history of the DC Universe. Two volumes, special edition with George Perez, the book that laid out what the DC Universe was going to be in the post-crisis in terms of its history. So my feeling was if you were going to put that much effort and just set aside the time to discuss Azrael in any way in that volume, that it should mean something. And the obvious thing to me, the two big books that got the Baxter treatment, you know, the, the books that were the best sellers for DC in the early 80s, were Titans and Legion. And in fact, Paul Levitz had come in and written a, a few issues of Titans when Marv Wolfman was so blocked up as a writer after Crisis that he just, he couldn't get it done at all. And the only guy that he was trusted to come in to help him was Paul Levitz of Legion of Superheroes fame. It just felt like because of that, there should, that something explicit should be done to tie Azrael into the Legion of Superheroes and ideally to also use that to tie the Legion and the Titans together. But of course, we're doing this project in the year 2020 and beyond and you know this ideas were coming out in the mid 80s so the titans nor the legion are anywhere near the place they had been previously what do you do to make azrael interesting and the first thing i had in mind was well he would be the child of wildfire and dawnstar the two legionnaires who ended up getting wiped out of continuity for quite a few years after the um three boot after zero hour and there was a tendency because this was a ciscoid fueled project to maybe draw heavily from zero Zero Hour since he was alternating between episodes of his Zero Hour Strikes podcast and the Who's Editing podcast and because that particular period Zero Hours when I became invested as a DC fan invested in the greater universe and because it's doing walking stuff with time without again not unlike Azrael not really paying off if you look at Zero Hour the only things that really solidified in that book that had relevancy going forward was the reboot of the Legion the complete Ground Zero reboot, uh, Sand Superboy, which deferred from Christ of Inf- Infinite Earths for the better part of a decade. But there was an erosion of Legion continuity and, frankly, relevancy over that time period that necessitated the reboot. So that made that important for the Legion. And also uh, Hawkman consolidating into one being and emphasizing this sort of Highlander idea of him having existed in various incarnations throughout time and to some degree space. So Zero Hour had had never fully paid off. That's a very small return given how big of an event Zero Hour was. They even bothered to click into an omnibus even though I think pretty universally it's regarded as not being a very good book. And so trying to pay off Zero Hour somewhat fueled the comments project. It's okay. Well, we'll we'll do Azrael and we'll have him be from a, a later generation of Legionnaires. He'll be kid of Wildfire and Dawnstar. Two Legionnaires that I like, fine, but we're never really big favorites in part because I really invest in the Legion as part of the Archie Legion, the three boot uh, that came out of Zero Hour and they weren't big parts of that. They weren't even introduced until fairly late in the game and if they weren't at all, now that I think about it, I think I might have already left a readership of Legion by the time they were introduced. If that ever did happen, they might have not had that happen until like the Lightning Saga when they started debooting back to the mid-80s Levitt's Legion. But as the project progressed, that seemed boring. I'd given Azrael his own series and 
because of all the stuff going on with the atomic books where I'd realized going into edition two, edition three of who's editing that I needed to pay off the atomic aspect. You know, well, what does it mean to have an atomic maxi series? Well, probably you're going to need to blow some shit up. And I thought, okay, well, we're going to blow up the DC Earth. And at the onset, the plan was to do what always gets done on these things where we're going to blow up the Earth and get all post-apocalyptic. And then we're going to put everything back together again a little bit differently so that you get another reboot of the DC Universe. That's been done many, many, many times, which is one of the reasons why I decided not to do that this time. But I didn't know that that early on. I was it, it, the, uh, the grand scheme of the comments game hadn't really solidified yet. But at that point in time, the idea was well, we're going to blow up the Earth. And since I'm already doing this Morningstar book with Azrael, I didn't want to call it Azrael because there were already was a more famous person named Azrael in the DC Universe in the Batman titles. And since I decided, well, we're going to do the child of these two Legionnaires. So you want to allude to that by adding, you know, instead of a Dawn Star, this would be, I don't know, a Death Star or as I ended up going with a Morning Star, where instead of having it be Lucifer, as in the morning, uh, the dawn, the morning, uh, it was a pun that would be morning, as in the morning, the deaths of people, morning, the death of the earth. So the idea going forward from that was that Azrael was going to be the cause of the death of the DC Universe, specifically the New 52. In the early part of the comments game, the idea was, okay, well, I'm going to explore the New 52, and then I'm going to blow that up, and then we're going to take it back to a DC Universe that I found more palatable, which again, as things progressed, I decided it was too much of a cliche and I wanted to go in a different direction, but that's where the Azrael trajectory was at that time. And then as I was working with the Azrael stuff, I, I besides the fact that I thought that I was lame and obvious, they'd already done a wildfire Dawnstar hybrid character in Tony Bedard's Rebels or E-B-E-L-S in, what was it, 06, 09, some shit like that. Whatever that series was, they'd already done that. So this making Azrael have that parentage was both obvious and redundant, redund rendered redundant by this other character that had been created pre-New 52. And so as I was exploring the New 52 and having that inform the direction of the comments game, I got more and more into the Titans since the Titans had one of the more controversial and provocative reboots of the New 52. I knew that it was unloved, let's say, be honest, reviled by Titans fans and that it had gotten one of the earliest rebirthings you could I guess you could say because it only lasted I think a couple of three years into the New 52 and they were already doing a new Titan series a few years before they'd gone into the rebirth era obviously the Titans have had a devout following going back until at least the 80s New Teen Titans series I'm sure there are people that were fans back in the 60s and 70s as well but obviously the 80s series was a flashpoint and it's one of those things like X-Men where you're always going to have a portion of a fan base coming back to this material just because that was like the comics that they loved the most in a, in a certain time period. Not only do you have the people who were fans of the original new Teen Titans, or I guess you could say the, they were obviously titularly the new Teen Titans, so they're not the originals. Me, as much as I, I liked those Titans, my golden period is still the Titans Hunt, which I know is heretical, but obviously that was a shot in the arm of that uh, franchise. There was a franchise again because of the Titans Hunt, so it's got its fans. Then after that, you got the Jeff Johns, Mike McCone revival that was quite popular. And because Young Justice got folded into the Titans franchise, there's a lot of love for both the original series that Peter David and Todd Nock did and then the cartoon series. So there's just been perpetual revivals of interest in Titans going back to at least the 1980s. And so where a lesser title might have had such a horrendous launch as the New 52 one and then gone away for a long period of time, that DC hadn't enough investment in the concept of a Teen Titans team to just restart it again to try to appease those fans that they had frankly abused with the New 52 speaks to the quality of those characters but it also means that they must have done some really fucked up shit in that run so I had an aversion to reading that material or a lot of the New 52 material because I, I hadn't fully invested in the idea of exploring the New 52 in the project yet and so I put that off for months but the problem though is there were a fair few titans in those earlier issues I knew at some point I was going to want to tie Azrael into the Titans and further on the Legion. And so I knew at some point I was going to have to deal with Titan stuff and I dipped my water, my toe into the water slowly. And in particular, there was a lot of stuff involving this character Harvest who was supposed to be from like the 30th and 31st century. He was a major driving force in that uh, New 52 series. And the more research I did into the New 52, the more those early stories cycled around this guy. And he, he looked cool. He looked like he was off of a metal cover from the 80s. You know, a skull face with wings.
wings and lots of leather and stuff. What's not the like? And as a result of DC abandoning a lot of their New 52 plans, Harvest just got chucked in the dumpster as well. His story was never really resolved. And since so much was invested in that story for it to just be abandoned, it, it was hard for me to resist the pull of going back to that guy and finding out what his deal was and uh, what it meant to the Titans, which ultimately meant diving into the Superboy series, which in turn would alter the course of everything I was trying to do with the comments project. So Aztec is another one of those characters that I look at and just sort of say, why are you? Is it a great costume? It is not. Do they introduce a new fictional city for the DC universe? Sure. I like that. I like that DC has fake cities. Cool. <sighs> Art, not super. And Stephen Harris, that's the only thing he ever did. I, I want to say he worked on The Crush for the short-lived Motown comics. Want to be milestone in print at Image Comics. He's not a terrible artist or anything like that, but I don't know that anybody who's ever been a N. Stephen Harris fan. The book was co-written by Grant Morrison and Mark Millar when Millar was just doing his best impersonation of a Grant Morrison type before he became his own person, which is essentially the comic book movement of a shock jock, which frankly Aztec the ultimate man could have used because I I've read a number of issues didn't feel like, like there was a lot of there there I think that there's an inference of Aztec being Latino but it was extremely oblique if that was the case uh, in the years since they've replaced Aztec with a female more clearly Latinx heroine that hasn't amounted to a lot but a hooray representation at least I, I just don't know to do with Aztec there's not a lot that he contributes to the greater DC universe which is probably why he got killed off in a JLA arc because he was the most readily expendable character available to Grant Morrison. I really love the late Steve Lytle's cover for the last issue of Aztec that initiated his joining the Justice League. I'm pretty sure that last issue sold better than any other issue that ever came out. It was off reference in that time period. But really, beyond seeing Lytle draw the JLA, I didn't see a lot of value in Aztec and um, that opinion hasn't changed much in the last, what, 20 years or so. So... Upper middle class, yuppie, no real problems in the world, Superman continued to have adventures for a number of years after Burn left that the vast majority of comic book fans didn't fucking bother with until he died and somebody decided to fill the super boy sized hole in continuity with Connell, who looked entirely too much like Informa. You know, say daddy, me snow me, I go blam, I lick you boom boom down. And I'm sorry, the Metropolis kid sucks, but he still managed to get his own hundred issue solo series. He gets put in the team tight. He's in Young Justice. They did a revival right before the New 52. Connor Kent Connell has his fans. I'm not one of them, but it does show that there is an interest in the concept of a Superboy. And it actually is kind of interesting to have a Superboy existing in the same time period as a Superman and be his sidekick to some degree. I don't think anybody really wants him hanging out with Superman all the time. But it's neat to see a Superman family without going down the very dangerous road of having Superman have a kid. <clears throat> and especially I thought it was really interesting when they decided to... To make it to where Lex Luthor had contributed his DNA to the Superman clone that became Connell. Uh, it definitely gives you a lot of interesting avenues you can explore that you couldn't do with the actual proper Superman. But you know, they killed him off in Infinite Crisis, so he was gone for a little while there. Then they brought him back again. You had Superboy Punches, you had Superboy Prime slash Superman Prime, who was from Earth Prime, which is supposed to be our Earth. And then he goes nuts because of Christ on Infinite Earths, and he starts killing everybody and he's this total sociopath and Jeff Johns does this really bad not remotely meta text uh, pretending that Superboy Prime is an analog for the most toxic elements of comic book fandom oh and I think while Connell was dead Jeff Johns and his old boss Richard John uh, Donner decided to do a tribute to the late Christopher Reeve by introducing Christopher Kent who ultimately is revealed to be the son of I think Ursa and General Zod but were at one point raised by by Superman and Lois Lane is a surrogate son. So it just goes to show you, you take a Superboy away from the DC universe in which he is a concern. And what happens is you end up with this reverberation, this antagonist of effect where you go from one Superboy to one, two, three, four Superboys. We count the pocket dimension one. And that's just pre New 52. So to get back on track, despite my hesitation, despite my avoidance, I eventually did have to 
to delve into the new 52 Superboy by Scott Lobdell and various. So it figures heavily into the Scott Lobdell Teen Titans relaunch, which of course is in a weird place because everything's been truncated to a five year time frame and nobody is a direct descendant of the iconic DC superheroes. So you've got Tim Drake, I think largely working independently of Batman, if not entirely so, under a different identity. And the kid who is the current kid Flash has uh, no direct relationship to Barry or Wally. And ultimately he's revealed to be from some weird 30-ish century future. But he's not the Bart Allen. He's like a Bart Allen or he assumed that identity, but it wasn't his true identity. It's This is getting back into the problem with the New 52 that they made the DC Universe more complicated rather than less complicated in a way that post-crisis DC continuity fuck-ups could not imagine you know being a thing that anybody would ever attempt attempt <sighs> There is no short version of what they made out of Connell. I'll do my best. They give him a red and black uni- uh, uniform and they decide that he is still a clone slash genetically created being. It would seem like he would be in a place like Star Labs because at least uh, old school fans would be able to grasp that. But instead they come up with a whole new acronym agency called Nowhere. That's, I guess, the evil version of Star Labs. And they're the ones who cook this guy up. And at least in the early days of the series, it functions as a prequel to Lobdell. Teen Titans and they somehow managed to work Fairchild from Gen 13 into there basically because it was a big priority at the early part of the New 52 to try to incorporate Wildstorm concepts which was abandoned a couple of years in. I have some theories as to why that would be. You know because there's no good reason if DC 100% owns the Wildstorm properties and they don't owe any money to anybody else or anything else there's no reason why you wouldn't be able to do a whole bunch of stuff with the that material and incorporating it into the DC universe and it was kind of a selling point of the New 52 that they were going to integrate the Wildstorm properties into the DC universe even though I don't think either DC fans or Wildstorm fans were particularly keen on that which is funny because Wildstorm had been very thoroughly driven into the ground by the time you got to the New 52 but just as simply it seemed like they took a lot a lot of liberties with the Wildstorm characters that the Wildstorm fans could not brook and perhaps that contributed maybe they just decided they wanted to give them a cooling off period and an attempt to re- introduce them at a future date because they'd screwed about so badly. But anyway, Superboy is supposedly the creation of this nowhere organization and he's rescued by Fairchild from Gen 13 who is infiltrated nowhere specifically to try to confront this evil scientific organization and Superboy gets loose and he's feared and hated and one of the people involved with either nowhere or Harvest, the evil future being that plagues the Teen Titans I, I don't recall who specifically Specifically, she's supposed to be associated with initially, but Ravager, the daughter of Deathstroke, gets tied in heavily with Superboy and, to a lesser degree, Teen Titans, who eventually had a spinoff called Ravagers that starred Fairchild that was sort of a quasi-Teen Titans crossover with Gen 13 in terms of properties. We're getting deep in the weeds on that, but I guess we kind of need to explain the concept of Harvest. Again, this dude is from, like, the 30th century-ish, and this was a few future where metahumans had either caused a lot of destruction or had seemingly displaced humanity or it might be a situation like the fuckwads with uh, khakis and tiki torches from a few years ago who are just shouting that the Jewish metahumans will not replace us and so since the 20th slash 21st century was when you had the greatest flourish of metahuman life on earth Harris decides he's going to go back in time and try to stymie that however he very much like a Dr. Evil is not very direct or effective in that attempt and so instead what he ends up doing is dicking around with teen metahumans a whole bunch and trying to make them fight each other and produce like the most powerful and ruthless metahumans who I guess he's going to send to fight other metahumans it's super convoluted never makes a ton of sense point is that Harvest is in the past to dick with metahumans with a specialty on teens and he's sort of like I guess the Creasy from Cobra Kai of the New 52 and one other wrinkle is they make a big point of clones being verboten on Krypton. Apparently at one point, Kryptonians were into cloning and there was a clone revolt and a whole bunch of people died. And so they want nothing to do with any kind of clones. And when they brought in the more Krypton-centric Supergirl, she has a major hate on for any Kryptonian clones and is the one who actually dubs the cloned Superboy Con-El because apparently Con-El 
Kill is a derogatory term for clones from Krypton, which is pretty weird because since Superboy ultimately ends up adopting that term, it's like calling himself like the N-word of Krypton or something. I think it's indicative of a poor self-image in this fellow. And so much of the first year of the New 52 Superboy series is just con L going around and around, having troubles with the Nowhere organization that birthed him, with the Teen Titans that are uh, constantly having negative interactions with Nowhere and view them as villains. They get Gen 13 in there at some point since they've already introduced Fairchild. Might as well go ahead and get Grunge and Lot into them. And he's just like having all these fights with all these people that don't really amount to much. And there's all these mysteries that aren't being resolved. And to some degree, it culminates in a crossover called The Culling, uh, which is supposed to be Harvester, sorry, Harvester, Harvest, trying to have all the young metahumans that he's captured and influenced fight each other so that only the strong survive. And he's sort of, I guess, like Marvel's Apocalypse. And they start introducing old forgotten Titans and a bunch of Wildstorm characters like Warblade, but this time he's evil. And then they get, uh, they'd done a Legion Lost series where they took a bunch of the Legionnaires that were popular pre-crisis that had been abandoned by the Archie reboots, bring them to the fore as a team of Legionnaires that were trapped in the 20th century. And so they're interacting constantly with Superboy, the Teen Titans, the Nowhere Organization, the Wildstorm characters, yada de yada de. And of course, one of those characters is, actually both of those characters are the planned parentage of Azrael. Dawnstar and Wildstorm both are part of this Legion Lost team that have these close talk calls with the Titans. And so that obviously recalls the idea of having Azrael in some way tie into both the Titans and the Legion. At some point, Tom DeFalco comes in and writes a bunch of this stuff because he was somebody that anybody ever cared about besides him being editor-in-chief of Marvel for a good chunk of the 90s. All the blame goes on Jim Lee for this, I think. He's the one who decided that we needed to have Bob Harris at DC Comics. And then before you know it, we've got Howard Mackey, obviously DeFalco, an unwanted presence at DC. He got run out on the rail within like a year or so. Now might be a good moment to pause and consider the new 52 Teen Titans. I'm sure there is a large number of people that would rather not ever address this group again, but this is what we're doing here. I don't even remember if Tim Drake was supposed to still be a Robin, but he was the leader of this team. He was referred to as Red Robin and he had actual falcon wings that nobody liked and they got rid of as soon as his volume was over with. You had the Connell clone Superboy who now had a sort of barcode Superman symbol on his arm. I'm not going to say it looked better than the uh, weird clone suit that he had in his own title. It's hard to fuck up red and black and it does look kind of cool. I do think it's interesting to have the Superman tattoo, especially in modern times. They're so prevalent these days. It used to be a real unusual outlier to have tattoos. Now they're on our superheroes. You had a kid that was titled Kid Flash, was referred to as Bart Allen, but turned out to be a whole different guy who was involved with like an oppressive regime and may have been involved with the deaths of some people and was kind of a bad dude with a redemption arc, but they don't really really getting that into the early days. You've got Wonder Girl who they just royally fucked up. She's like got these Greek powers including a lasso that's made out of cosmic barbed wire and a hood and she's a thief and she just, she's trash. They really fucked up Wonder Girl among the other people. And you got this one girl called Skitter who is essentially a roach themed super heroine with uh, weird little insect legs and powers vaguely related to cockroaches. Uh, there's actually a character similar I think it's Slave Labor or Action Lab called Rochelle uh, and then there's also a Latino fellow named Bunker uh, who they have a lot of proclamations about the feeling that he's going to be like one of the great heroes amongst them they do a good job of trying to hard sell this kid uh, he is also a uh, one of the rare gay superheroes and you also have one called Solstice apparently they didn't have access or the desire to use Starfire since Lobdell was also writing the book that Starfire was appearing out of the time right Hood and the Outlaws so they had a, a late girl who had a similar visual effect. She could fly and leave a trail of fire slash hair and she was all black instead of being golden, but not that far apart from the, the Starfire characters of old. As I look through the issue, I'm seeing that there is a definitive connection to Batman, but I think that it's a situation where Tim Drake was supposed to be his partner for a matter of weeks or months, not a long-term affair, which is a pretty harsh way to treat essentially the most successful Robin of all time, at least in terms of solo series. This kid carried a book 
book for over a decade. But all hell fucking Damian Wayne, right? So Tim pulls this team together over a number of issues and it has somewhat flashy art by Brett Booth. Never one of the most highly regarded of the Wildstorm artists, but I always liked the guy aside from the weird noses. And he's become a pretty major DC mainstay since the purchase of Wildstorm back in the 90s. And frankly, he's a good fit for Titans material. There's a lot of people who bash on that period, but I don't know too many people that really had a problem with the artwork. It was nice. You know, it was attractive. Booth just has a very youthful style. It's a good fit for this type of book. The series is a slow burn. It takes the first six issues or so just to get the team together and introduce the newer heroes, get a sense of who they are, what their powers are, what their conflicts are. Skitter is afraid every time she turns into her metahuman form. She's haunted by visions of the horrors that this person inflicts and she's afraid that she's not going to be able to regain her human form from the roach self that takes control when she's using her powers. Bunker is a chatterbox. He's anxious so he talks too much and uh, uses that to cover for his concerns about you know pregnant silences and the like. He's also very it's very important to him to prove himself as a hero a competent hero that kind of stuff. I know a lot of older fans that really hate this material because it eradicates much of Titan's history. I think it's decent for what it is. I, I think if you're a teenager reading this book it would work well for you. I just don't know how many teenagers are reading comic books in the year 2011 going forward but it's got nice art it's got nice coloring the kids are relatable it's nowhere near as awful as a lot of older fans make it out to be uh, but obviously if you're a Titans fan and you're seeing the entirety of Titans history eradicated by this volume I can see where you would take umbrage with that but come on guys Harvest is pretty darn cool looking again it's hard to beat red and black and he sort of looks like a xenomorph from the Aliens franchise as well pretty boss one major handicap though probably a crippling one is that they wrote Superboy Teen Titans and Legion Lost as interconnecting titles. You really couldn't read any one of them without the others, especially once they moved into the culling crossover. And furthermore, it involved annuals, so it was a pretty big commitment to ask to follow three titles to make sense of any one of them. But I still think you could do worse. They were bringing in a lot of New 52 versions of Titans characters in with that arc. A little of is in that one, Thunder and Lightning. I thought the, the black and white outfits they brought in or the culling outfits uh, more broadly looked nice it was neat to see titans and legionnaires working together especially alongside all these wildstorm characters although i think that perhaps more of an effort should have been made to retain the visual distinctiveness of the wildstorm characters many of the return titans and wildstorm characters were essentially unrecognizable so there is definitely a sense of them being the characters in all but name especially because the personalities were widely altered to fit with the story arc a lot of characters that should have been heroes were essentially villains and especially when they're murderously so that can definitely be alienating for their established fan bases so much of that first year is devoted to harvest and nowhere and the culling concept that you really needed i think a firm resolution to this crossover arc which never comes we we never really get the full story on who harvest was or why he was doing what he was doing so for so many comic books to be generated around something that doesn't get resolved it gets tossed in the waste bin that's not helpful in maintaining reader interest they brought in a bloodlines character to that's not winning any over anybody i mean i'm like the one guy that that would play to and i didn't buy these books this might also be a good time to transition into legion lost dc has this weird history of not being to sell able to sell one legion title so they decide to give us two they did it with legion of superheroes and legionnaires before they started making them essentially a single title that bounced back and forth between themselves they did it again when they had the legion of superheroes and legion lost coming out of new 52 in particular the team that was trapped in the 20th 21st century earth were characters that were at their most popular decades earlier and who had largely been set aside for you know you know they they, they just hadn't maintained their fan bases so it's kind of weird to have a team book involving timberwolf wildfire tyrock dawnstar and Telus, who had been abandoned by the greater legion continuity for a long time and giving them their own book now i think if you're going to do it getting a team like fabian nicieza and pete woods is a good call it was probably the best book that could be produced under those circumstances with those characters but it was also an early casualty of the new 52 it barely got out a year's worth of issues it's a nice looking book but there really wasn't an audience for it anymore and i'm not
not sure that it was clearly articulated that you really needed to buy three titles to follow Titans, Superboy. You couldn't easily get any one of those books without getting the other books. And aside from the sales bump that came with the New 52, I think a lot of people just decided not to get any of them or to just get Titans and bitch about it. But it is uh, somewhat revelatory because not that long ago I was listening to a podcast that was extolling the virtues of the new Warriors as written by Fabian Nicieza. And it's uh, peculiar that people that were so enamored with Fabian Nicieza's work on that title wouldn't support him on a Titans title or a Legion title, whatever. It could be the simple fact that the creators on Titans Lost were most associated with Marvel properties in mo- particular X titles. Uh, Pete Woods is probably best known for working on Deadpool and Fabian Nicieza did X-Force, New Warriors. He also had an extended stay at Valiant, but he's not well known as a guy who does DC Comics. So it's it, I can appreciate wanting to reach outside of DC to produce a title, but there's also an element of this being such a DC title that it wouldn't necessarily attract people from outside the normal DC readership. And again, put simply, a a title of this sort that's also involving a bunch of Wildstorm characters isn't necessarily going to be be appealing to Legion fans, Marvel, uh, or uh, DC fans in general. Regardless of the track record of the creative forces, it's kind of a big ask to even make a book like Teen Titans, or Titans Lost, I keep screwing it up. That should say the a bit of the tail end of itself is that I can't seem to recall the book I'm talking about at the moment and this is an essential book to read out of a trilogy a monthly trilogy beside another issue uh, specific to the culling is I guess when I was a teenager I really didn't mind seeing teenagers abused and killed as an adult and especially as one who has had to live in the world that we live in now with all the school shootings and the like I'm just not super comfortable with seeing teenagers put into danger mortally dangerous circumstances you know maybe it'd be exciting for the theoretical teenage audience for these comic books but for me it's not only a turnoff but it it just makes me feel icky I I don't take any pleasure in this but also comics cost four bucks a piece now so you it's pretty high bar to clear to get me to pick up any of this shit They call us problem child. We spend our lives on trial. We walk an endless mile. We are the youth gone wild. We think you're special. Alan Richard Jones, Dr. Angie, Artificial Twins, Beatly Mania, Canoes, Chris Dunford, Chris Lytton, Chris Thompson, Debosh, Dave's Comic Heroes blog, Del Dracula, Doc Strange, Dear Cashton, who added thanks ours, P. Ed Moore, El Romero Mero, FKA Jason, The Hammer Strikes, Random Cheeky Stuff, History of Comics on Film, Iowa's Joe in the 90s, Jan Sipkorver, Jeffrey Brown, John Kiala Mullinge, JMT-Pro.K.S.C.G.S.F. Podcast, Ken Yama 65, Legionnaire, Mark Dykeman, Martin Gray, Michael Benson, Mike It Send Aliens to Me, Min Moon Cthulhu, Perturbed Renderings, Prairie Justice, A Greg Sanders Vigilante Podcast, Raven X Fields, Resurrections, An Adam Warlick and Thonos Podcast, Richard Field, Ronald Clark, Sean Phillips, Silver and Gold, Siskoid, Star Rocket Radio, Talk Nerdy to Me, Tim Price, The Podcrasher, Timothy Dears, Torah, vs. Comic Art, Wayne Burroughs, Wibbly Wobbly Dicey YCRPG Podcast, Wild Dog Podcast, and Wonder Woman, Warrior for Peace Podcast, on Vol 8, Canoes wrote, It's that time again thanks, dear watchers, a What of Comics Podcast wrote, Only to listen, I think, it was half emoji, Martin Gray wrote, Intriguing, and thank you, Dave's Comic Heroes blog offered a Burt Ward Robin gift saying holy showcase, Tasmia Mahler wrote, Tag me when you actually cover me in your podcast, on Vol 9, Jeffrey Brown wrote, I want to say as some Someone who didn't grow up reading the Silver Age Legion of Superheroes and Superboy comics. The only Superboy I was aware of was Cadmus clone Superboy. And seeing the Legion on episode of Supermantas, the post-crisis era. But yeah Connor Kent.
and Superboy from the Death and Return of Superman era I am most familiar with but I am aware of Superboy Prime from Infinite Crisis Countdown and that character got on my nerves being a whiny asshole who murdered a lot of B and C list characters in that crossover and I was watching Smilville in the 00 seconds around then too and I was a little into it but I was mostly familiar with Cal version of Clark not being Superboy in his teens and the post crisis elements have always stuck with me from a young age. I did read a little bit of 80s 90s Legion. Finally, my kits and aliens to me chided. Is his model really ever a bonus?